Welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Mercurio, and I am the executive director of Cambridge Common Writers. We are, as you no doubt know, a volunteer alumni association for the Leslie MFA in creative writing. And we've been around since about 2018, and things have really picked up steam this year in no small part, thanks to the contributions of our board members and our volunteers. Um, we are it is our tradition to host a virtual reading during the residency so that alums who are not able to make the trek to Cambridge for reasons of time, money, distance, what have you, are able to feel like there is a connection to the residency spirit. And this year, uh, because the pandemic has uh, abated a bit, we actually have folks on campus at Leslie, you can see them. Let me spotlight them so everyone can see them. Look at those folks. Um, and they are in Cheryl 350, which is on Leslie's South Campus. It's a new venue for the MFA program. Uh, this is the first year that folks have been on that campus for the program. So um, it's my pleasure and my honor tonight to introduce our alums who will be sharing their work with us tonight. Uh, we are starting with a Writing for Stage and Screen alum, Fabiola Decius, who graduated in June 2015. Uh, she has a number of plays out in the world. They include Haiti Shali, Final Verdict, in sync, ice cream bucket list, date night surprise, chicksmiths, draped in history, free before eleven, consent, black Jesus, bus stop, man of the house, and fighting forgiveness. If those titles don't actually make you want to see every single one of these plays, we are very different people. Um, ice cream bucket list really uh, intrigues me, but date night surprise. I mean that that's got to be good. Um, Fabiola's plays have been produced and or developed at Bryn Mawr College, Leslie, uh, the Boston Public Library, the Our Voices Festival, the Fade to Black Festival, the Roxbury Repertory Theater, Controlled Chaos Productions, the Office of War Information, Bureau of Theater, Company One Theater, the Boston Theater Marathon, the Boston Center for the Arts Plaza Theaters, and the Boston Neighborhood Network Channel. Fabiola was a Creative City Grant recipient through the New England Foundation for the Arts in 2018 and founded Teens Write, which stands for Writing, Reading, and Investigating Theater Everywhere. This is a program for teenagers to write, revise, cast, direct, and produce original plays, culminating in a 10-minute play festival. Fabiola is also currently a high school theater arts educator in the city of Boston. She graduated from Bryn Mawr College with a Bachelor of Arts and received her MFA at Leslie. Uh, and I'm going to spotlight Fabiola and turn things over to her. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Michael. Again, my name is Fabiola Decius. I am super excited to be with you this evening and present a relatively new play. Uh, this play is called Ashley's admirers. I have two actors who are actually two of my theater students. Um, they're actually junior students. I've had them since the eighth grade and I told them about this opportunity and I told them I was looking for actors and they were like, uh, you have actors in this class. I was looking for adult actors, but they're like, you have actors in this class. So I ended up writing a fairly new piece over the weekend. Uh, sent it to them, I believe, Sunday. Monday was a holiday. We practiced a few times on Tuesday, recorded it. And so I am going to be showing you the recording of that. Uh, my actors are Du Bois Rogers and Gabriella, also known as Gabby LeBoy. They're on the Zoom call, but I don't think they're going to be showing their faces, which is totally okay, because you will see their faces in the video. So without further ado, this is Ashley's Admirers. To what? Action. 
So now we're gonna do our eyebrows. Um, one is thinner than the other, this one specifically. Um, basically, just trying to you know, shape them up a little bit more, round them out a little bit more, and just basically make them look more cool. Um, you know, I like to just brush them out. That really helps the more bushier effect. Um, this one's already kind of set, but I mean, it's the best one I do right now. We need to stop. I'm in the middle of one. said we need to talk. Okay. <laughs> it has to wait because I have to post this video before school starts. Oh, no, I have to fix my angle. Ugh. Okay. Um, well, I already like pulled my lashes and I already put on mascara, so that's kind of done. Basically just like a couple curls. Hello, Ashley's admirers. I'm Craig. And I'm the reason that she even has this page in the first place. And I'm something really important. You're not the reason I have a page. Say so you swear, like I was the one who gave you the idea. Okay, you may have hinted at it, but I was already vlogging, so. But you never posted it anywhere, and I told you you should. So, you're welcome. <sighs> That's my biggest problem with you. You never give me any credit when it's due, and I'm such a good friend to you, but. You know what? Let me just record this later because obviously you have something you want to get off your chest. You're right, I do have something I need to get off my chest. Starting with the bats under your eyes. It's very much giving no sleep. Okay, rude. Because I didn't sleep really well that night, last night, but it's whatever, I guess. Is it because you're on the phone with Aubrey? Who's Aubrey? Don't play with me, Ashley. I'm not playing with you. I don't know what you're He's liking all of your pictures. A lot of people like my pictures. It's one of us being an up and coming influencer, you know? You would know if you had any influence. You think you're funny. Kind of funny, beautiful, intelligent, you know, maybe even. Treacherous. Treacherous? It means likely to betray. <laughs> I know what it means. I'm just trying to figure out why you're calling me that. <sighs> because you stole my man. Craig, what are you talking about? <sighs> you knew I liked him. Ooh. So we're back to playing dumb. Seriously, I have no idea what you're talking this about. This is what I'm talking about. Graham? <sighs> so you do know him? No, I mean, we're talking. Say you swear. I swear? Oh my god. So you guys are over here talking and I can't even get him to open up my messages? I mean... I mean, yeah, we were on FaceTime. I FaceTime? Mean, I mean, I need to be honest with you, this is not a great look. You're not a good look for me. We're supposed to be friends, and this is the second time you've done this. Second time? When was the first? Don't you mean who was the first? Need I remind you of Joshua? That was not my fault. It's never your fault, Ashley. Oh my gosh, your contouring is off. No, it's not, but you're just saying that because you're upset. So of course I'm upset. You stole my man. <laughs> you sound ridiculous about Aubrey, Joshua, anyone else you talk about. Here you go. Gaslighting me. Again. <sighs> okay, I'm definitely not doing that, but okay. Great. More gaslighting. Anyways, for the record, he didn't want you either, and he looks very happy. He's <laughs> not happy with this conversation with you. Where Obviously, are you going? I'm going to school, so I'm going to need class. Um, school didn't even start yet. We still have about five more minutes. I want to get this video edited before. Okay, starts. tell me. Who reached out to who? You're still on this? I need answers. Okay, I reached out to him. <gasps> so you reached out to him knowing that I liked him? You know, I don't know why you are still on this because Graham is just. You know, wow. keep going. he's not Graham. It's all because his name is Graham. Don't you think I know the name of my man? Anyways, whatever. Oh my gosh, I literally can't deal with you. This is Aubrey. Hello. This is Aubrey. Okay, so that's your pretend man. And this is Graham. So, my Graham and your Aubrey are the same person. Yes, it's literally what I've been trying to tell you for like the last 30 minutes. <sighs> I thought he wasn't into you. That's not what he said when he slipped into my DM. 
Hmm, how must we act? The fact that you literally showed me a message that said... We're not talking about that message. You know... Um, a lot of people do. Okay, so what is he like? Catfishing or? No, because I know exactly who he is, both version, and what's wrong with catfishing anyways? <laughs> no, you did not just ask me what's wrong with catfishing. Catfishing can be Ashley, damaging. Ashley, please don't tell me that you caught feelings for Aubrey. His name is Graham. So you do like him. My fault. You didn't mean to fuck him. Okay, I do not like him. I'm just using him to get some more followers. Of course you would. I have to be honest though, I'm not really talking to Aubrey and he never said my dance. Trust me, I already knew that. <sighs> I am talking to Graham though, and it could happen. I'm so confused. I'm going to tell you something and please don't get upset. What did you do? No, like, long finger promise. Long finger promise, you would not get upset. <sighs> okay. So, I may have made you another page. Like a bandage? Um, you can say that. Okay, so why would I be mad? Like, does it have followers? Or... Quite a few. Okay, so let me see. Ooh, Ashley's admirers. This is cute. I mean, it doesn't have as much attraction as my own page, but hold on. What? You're talking to Graham? Um, technically, you're talking to Graham? It's the page, remember? That you created. I didn't even know it existed until just now. <sighs> Out of all of the crazy things you've done in our friendship, this has to be the craziest. Okay. I can't believe you cried. Okay, okay, but you long finger promise you wouldn't get upset. This is how I feel about your long finger. <gasps> okay, Hi. it's giving <laughs> cut the cuticles, file the nails, and get them horrendous hands done after school. Please book an appointment. <laughs> that just goes to show how much you know about nails because you don't cut your cuticles, you simply push them back. And if I were you, I wouldn't be talking about hands seeing like, well, your hands look like they've been sitting in a sack of flowers. So maybe try some freaking lotion. Okay, it's the comeback for me. So what are we doing after school? After we delete the fake page and you stop talking to Graham? Do we really have to? How can you guys have all the fun? Playing with someone's emotions is not what I consider fun. Says the person who is using someone to get more followers. And I doubt you'd be saying that if you saw this. Wait, he sent that? Oh no, we're gonna have a little more fun with this page and have a little more fun with Graham. Um, Anyways, I wow. can't be doing this. All right, did my nails really look that bad though? Honestly, they're not that bad. Like, you do need to book that for me, sister. Oh, like God. now. <laughs> that was amazing fabiola and i'm i hope you're not all too jealous of the fact that i have the video and can watch it again i'm gonna uh, add fabiola as a spotlight here um and i have a question before before we move on um so isn't aubrey graham drake's first name? <laughs> hmm. it, it actually is and um I think Gabby, because I, I, like I said, I asked for the students' input in writing the the play. So I asked them about some of the themes they were interested in. What would they like their character names to be? And yes, that is Drake. I'm glad you got the reference because I wasn't sure if people would. I personally didn't. Um, initially, it wasn't until after the fact they were like, "Yeah, that's Drake," and I was like, "Oh, okay." Yeah. But, yeah, I I'm hipper than I look. <laughs> Sort of. Certainly hipper than me. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that very much, but that was amazing, Fabiola. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, thank you to both Du Bois and Gabby for the incredible, incredible acting jobs that you did. Um, I, I loved every second of it. It was wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. All right. And now I am going to spotlight Dan Carey. Who will be reading next and give Dan a quick introduction. So Dan Carey hails from the North Shore of Massachusetts. He's a June 2021 poetry graduate and he is currently living in San Francisco. Dan's poems have appeared in Dropout Literary Journal, Anti-Heroin Chic, 
and Crosswinds Literary Journal. He is currently at work on his first book of poems. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, Michael, for uh, putting this or for taking care of hosting this event for us tonight. And it's really good to see you and everyone else here. Uh, see everyone over there at Cheryl 350. I hope everyone's having fun at uh, residency. Uh, I'm just going to get right to it. I have um, six poems to read. Um, I think it'll be just about five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> to the cousins I barely know. Some of you have done time. Some have disappeared into and out of bars. Some succeeded in leaving our family somewhere between Bridgewater and Percocet. Cousins, you grow like galaxies. When I think of how many planets you could be, in our family, blood takes the form of a tree or it loiters shapeless as dust that molds into the stars. Dad didn't talk much back then. So how could I know another of you won a few bare knuckle fights, got jumped and was left for dead while your sister knocked down Max's door with a baseball bat? In the space between us, bones break and I have stories only. Nothing when we meet at funerals. Instead of talk, we breathe a silence of cracked ribs in a strange cage. Uh, this next poem is called From Our Studio. Fast food thrives on COVID streets but each shift rotation that enters or leaves Jack in the Box, Geary and Eleventh, brings more worry than the clamor after an order that the crew who can't push the right buttons mistakes for another order. Munchers and chompers cringe when a sidewalk malingerer bursts in, abrupt as construction. Chicken sandwiches and thin cut fries come with sides of panic. Same goes for Burger King, where a man on his iPhone clutches his bag full of Whopper and tramples needles spread out like Roman candles. As empty buses skip the stops and the bare foot rank and stare. This poem's called A uh, Hand to Mouth. Overdue is a saber tooth, eating what's left of our youth. It's also a house cat thanking us for all the pets. C'est la vie, says the mangled kitty of commerce, who plucks some wooden nickels from his paw with his big teeth. Walking away, he fixes his collar, tucks windowed envelopes of checks into a pocket of fur, turns back and says, don't try what Danny did, which implies try. But by that point, I'm no longer answering to Dan. And the collection cat holds up a dew claw, letting it reflect moonlight from the eyes of both coyote and field mouse patiently waiting in forest darkness to be stunned. Safe passage home, meals included. Our nighttime poverty reeks of bygone failure. Like dollars we'd have saved had we not spent cold cash on the first burger joint we settled for. They didn't have lettuce and given the cheese, we resorted to beef. And so it goes, the money runs from customers to bosses to workers. Barbarically rich one week, I pay rent on time in my planner. A few days breeze by and burn, smelling like wildfires, and I bump expenses back or cross them out. <clears throat> this next one's called The Poet's Table. Can't make the 501 downtown express in Brighton Center, which trots by like a unicorn after the nick of time. 
So I get high instead, then take a cab late to the reading at Suffolk, after which poets gather for drinks at Scully Square. Wannabes invited to linger, broke and too shy to admit it, turn down offers to pick up their tabs. The overdraft fees mount. Everyone's already forgotten the hours of words off the page from some master or other, and latecomers who nod and pitch in a hmm to prove they are listening louder than the rest. Yeah, some quotes got jotted into their student notebooks, but with a seat at the poet's table, it's all about the whiskey now. Uh, this next poem is called Killing Time. Give me one second here. Killing Time. Ashtrays give evidence of my many breaks, many celebrations, the pats on the back type of smoke, a few pages written, read, and that podcast I meant to listen to, finally listened to. I fold the laundry and here I go, high time to crack a brew. In the morning work, play in the afternoon. The world churns as I stumble, remotely drunk, into the parade I feel I deserve. With nothing going on, I'll have to snag my least observed reward. The sun creeps, split second out from a cloud. The slant of its brief setting light oppresses before it means. And then uh, my last poem here uh, is called Before You Begin. There's the bale of bangs to be tied up, holding your hair evenly off both sides and shoulders. The gas stove becomes a landscape of pans. A cast iron pan salutes you with its handle. Water from the faucet helps you recollect the recipe you knew you knew. Maybe washing your hands isn't about cleanliness, but the steam that loosens your palms by the knuckles. You portion out cuts of butchered chicken with a sculptor's touch. A carpenter, you'd feel every notch in the oak. If you chose the beach as a workshop, Sand would turn into an Alcazar. Either way, it's all I can do to keep up in the cosmos of your kitchen and find my space, arrive on time at your table, ready like a plate. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dan. That was that was great. I I love hearing newer work from you because I, I remember your work from when you were in the program and I love the the way you weave humor in I love the the dry witty observations of your poems it's so great San Francisco is clearly treating you well and I'm looking forward to when you get that book together let me give a, a quick introduction of Emily uh, Emily Inoue Huey is the author of the forthcoming Beneath the Wide Silk Sky, which will be coming out from Scholastic in fall of 2022. While she was a student at Leslie, she had the privilege of studying with Chris Lynch, David Elliott, and Anita Riggio. Emily is a creative writing instructor at Salt Lake Community College. In addition to books, her passions include education, the arts, the outdoors, and her family. And let me get rid of myself. Take it away, Emily. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be reading today from Beneath the Wide Silk Sky. Um, and it's the story of a Japanese American teenager, uh, basically during the period between Pearl Harbor and when Japanese Americans were incarcerated in in mass. And um, the section I'm going to read for you today is um, after Pearl Harbor, uh, within 24 hours of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, FBI agents um, kind of swept through these Japanese American communities 
arresting leaders, so teachers, bankers, religious leaders, things like that. And um, the two characters in this scene know that that's been happening in bigger cities, but it hasn't happened in their area yet. Um, just, just trying to think what you need to know. Um, the characters are Sam, the protagonist, so a 16-year-old Japanese-American girl, and a boy, Hiro, also Japanese-American. And they are in an orchard in this kind of Japantown area of their island in Washington State, taking photos with um, a camera they've borrowed from Hiro's father when they hear this sound coming from their neighbor's house. Um, let's see. As I settled the film inside the camera, a long, low cry echoed through the orchard. What was that? I asked. Hero turned. Another well rang across the orchard. We looked at each other. That's Mrs. Omura, Hero said. Something dark and cold buried itself in the pit of my stomach. I clicked the camera closed. Hero was already running. Nestling the camera next to my body, I followed. My short, skirt hobbled strides, not nearly fast enough for Hero's long, loping gait. He bobbed up and down as he ran over the furrows, getting farther and farther ahead of me. Loud barking joined the wailing. When a low branch suddenly reached for me, I ducked. Hero slid to a stop near the south edge of the orchard. He crouched low in the bushes next to the waist-high picket fence, separating the orchard from the Omura's front yard. As I caught up, he turned sharply and gestured for me to get down. My ears were filled with a rhythmic throbbing, and my breath was jagged. I huddled beside Hero, still cradling the Leica, that's the camera, um, frost seat through my skirt, turning wet as it touched my skin. The barking continued, and another cry, this time rougher and more strangled, sliced the air. I peered through a break in the bushes. Tiny Mrs. Omura swayed on her front porch. A mustached Caucasian man in a black suit and a snap brim hat stood in front of her, holding out his arms. Two fluffy white Akitas barked from behind the screen door. No. Hero's face drained. It's actually happening. Where the road met the front walk, a taller, sallow-skinned man guided Mr. Omura. My neighbor's wrists were chained by handcuffs. The world constricted. Where? Where you take? Mrs. Omura asked. The man didn't answer. Hands shaking, I held up the Leica. I didn't have time to think, but something in me needed to get this shot. I raised the camera to my eye. Click. Mrs. Omura, blocked by the agent as she reached for her husband. Click. Mr. Omura, handcuffed, being pushed by the agent towards the car. Click. Mr. Omura, head bowed, shame etched into his face as the agent forced him into the back of the long black car. The tall man slammed the car door, shutting Mr. Omura inside, and the man on the porch finally lowered his arms. Mrs. Omura's Sobs stuttered and went silent. Soundless tears flowed down her face as the mustached man trudged to the waiting car. As the engine turned, Mrs. Omura clutched her sides, holding herself together. Mr. Omura didn't look back. He sat, head bowed, as the car peeled away. We watched it roll toward the main road, its metal flashing. When it, when it turned out of sight, Mrs. Omura crumpled to the front porch, her child-sized body shaking. Hero and I looked at each other. As one we stood, we picked our way over the fence and through the bushes, glancing together at the road. The car was gone, its motor barely audible in the distance, but the road still felt full of threat. The dogs pawed at the screen door, their nails clicking furiously. Mrs. Omura, sweet, elegant Mrs. Omura, always so shy and proper, just lay there, her forehead against the decking whispering in Japanese that I couldn't understand. Omura-san? I stepped onto the wooden porch. Mrs. Omura raised her head. Her face was twisted. I patted her back, not sure what else I could do. But after a few moments, her eyes focused on me. Tears still streaming down her face, she sat up and pulled her legs under her, kneeling, ladylike. Komenasai, she said, her voice bow breaking as she bowed low her head against the wooden slats once again. Moshiwake arimasen. No, please don't, I said in Japanese, horrified that she was apologizing. She tried to stand up, and I crouched to help her. Are you okay, Omura-san? Hiro asked, also in Japanese. She nodded, but swayed and grasped my offered hand tightly. Hiro looked at me, and in his eyes there was a deep, dark sadness. 
It was a look I knew and understood, the look of losing someone. For Hiro and me are mothers, for Mrs. Omura, her husband. I'll go get Dad, Hiro said. I nodded. He jogged down the stairs, then ran, fast and almost wild, towards his house. Mr. Tanaka can help, I said, still in Japanese, hoping my words were true. Mrs. Omura nodded, but swayed again. Please, let's sit while we wait, I said. Mrs. Omura nodded, and we sat on the porch steps, both facing the road where her husband had disappeared. Her hands still clutched mine. Behind us, the dogs whined, but no longer barked. Every so often, a stifled sob broke her silence like a punctuation mark. I patted her, feeling powerless to do more. It seemed longer, but it must have been less than ten minutes. Hiro came back with Mr. Tanaka, both huffing and sweating. Mr. Tanaka ran up the porch first, first, and Mrs. Omura fell into his arms. His hat fell from his head as, like a bursting dam, she let her suppressed cries explode over him, her body jerking as if she were actually breaking. Mr. Tanaka stroked her head. We will find him. We will find him. The way Mr. Tanaka held Mrs. Omura frightened me. It was one. It was like one might hold a crying child, with none of the hesitant formality that held our community together. The invisible structures had tumbled. There was nothing left but this. Thank you for having me. Emily, thank you for reading that. That was gorgeous and heartrending, and what an absolutely stunning introduction for young readers to a deeply shameful period in American history. Um, I, I really hope that the book tops the bestseller list and that it gets the attention that it so richly deserves. So thank you, thank so you for thank you for being part of the reading. Thank you for having me. All right, next up is Jody Hobbs Hessler. Um, Jody, I'm gonna add you to the spotlight and to just give a quick introduction. My cat has joined. Good. Um, I, I, would... I have a policy of knowing that I can't control what animals will do at any time. So they're welcome at any reading that I am hosting. So Jody Hobbs Hessler lives, writes, and teaches writing in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Her short stories, feature articles, book reviews, and essays have appeared in a range of places, including Craft, The North American Review Online, Gargoyle, Raleigh Review, Pithead Chapel, The Rumpus, Valparaiso Fiction Review, Prime Number Magazine, Change 7, Streetlight, Sequestrum, and elsewhere. Jody has also published dozens of articles in a range of local interest magazines, as well as book reviews in Pank, The Georgia Review, and other venues. And Jody, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, read a, a new story today that um, I abridged just a little bit for the for the time. It's it, it was under 1,500 words, but it still took a little longer to read, so I didn't want to go over it. It's called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Vera wants a cup of coffee and a muffin. She leaves her phone at her desk, runs a comb through her hair, and peeks at herself in the mirror at the front door before leaving. After months of self-imposed hermitage, grieving and working from home, today she's tired of her own company but leery of the world. She can't seem to go anywhere without someone recognizing her. Aren't you the lady whose daughter Weren't you on TV the other, the anniversary? Is there anything I can? This morning, it's the woman in front of her at the coffee shop, frosted gray hair and a ponytail, exercise leggings, zipped into a turquoise Patagonia windbreaker. You were so brave on TV. Vera's is one in an arsenal of gun control nonprofits, but what else could she do with all that sorrow? She lost herself in research, fundraised, lobbied Congress, for the shooting's first anniversary last week, she hit the Today Show. Your daughter too, of course. The woman in the coffee line prompts her with a straight line smile. People assume Vera wants to talk about what happened because she spent the better part of the last year talking about it for any forum that would host her. People assume talking to them is the same as talking to the world, that it costs her nothing. So brave. It's true that Mina was brave, but that's not why she died. She died because she was kind. 
kindness she didn't learn from Vera. It started after Vera's husband left when she curled into herself, ashamed to be too grief-stricken to parent properly, and Mina ferried cereal to her bedside, parroted her favorite Annie songs, performed impromptu dances, making Vera laugh and breaking her heart all over again. No one should be so good at shouldering other people's pain, so good at soothing it. Vera should have stopped her. Thank you, Vera says. She's learned to purse her lips tight after speaking, then focus on some distant object to demonstrate disengagement. Between the woman ahead of Vera and the cashier, the line extends five or six deep. They'll be stuck together a while, and she'd like to seal the distance between them as quickly as possible. The steamer blasts at the counter, its noise a screen to hide behind, and Vera allows her eyes to scroll the menu. This shop stands around the corner from her house, but she hasn't been inside since before the shooting. Everything is eerily the same and completely different at once. Her eyes rest on the listing of flavored syrups. Too sweet for her, but Mina had loved them. Honey lavender, her favorite. For days after it happened, the TV ran story after story about the hero who sacrificed herself for the rest of her office. One of only two deaths, reporters kept saying as if two were a small number of people to be shot dead at an ad agency on a Thursday afternoon. The other death was the shooter. Vera recognized his name from stories Mina told about the buffalo-shouldered fact checker at work. He's embarrassed about the way he talks, Mina said, so he hardly ever does. But he talked to Mina. He told her how his parents locked him out of the house when he was a kid any time he got in trouble how he sheltered under the back deck with cold rain streaming between its slats, shivering until the sun rose and he braved tapping at the door, how his father or mother would let him in. Take a shower, they'd say. You smell awful. Vera imagines Mina and Malcolm huddling toward each other over wilted sandwiches pulled from paper lunch sacks under the oak tree outside their building. She pictures Mina patting Malcolm's sturdy arm and imagines words she must have used to assure him that he'd be okay corny words about tomorrow, because she never lost faith in her future. Tox reports showed Malcolm was high on a wild cocktail of drugs, too high to see what was in front of him, Vera likes to think. The conglomeration of workers and office furniture must have, must have smeared into an indistinguishable muddle of colors and shapes. Mina racing toward him, waving her hands for him to see her and stop, just another blur. Only afterward, could he have realized what he'd done? The sound of tamping grounds wraps like gunfire and Vera jerks in surprise. The woman in front of her lasers her best understanding glance Vera's way as if she's made the same connection, even though neither of them was at the office building that day. She imagines her daughter's dying thoughts were silent pleas with the universe to keep Malcolm from pulling the trigger on himself. Tomorrow, she would have thought at him as hard as she could while light guttered and dimmed, her heart slowed and blood drained out of her. Tomorrow will be better, it always is. The line has crept forward and the woman in front of Vera is finally next, but she will not look away, no matter how hard Vera trains her eyes toward the highest point of the chalkboard menu on the wall behind the counter. She won't look away and she won't move aside to let Vera order. The cashier beyond them taps a black lacquered fingernail against his iPad, waiting. Vera wishes now she had stayed home, ignoring more emails and phone calls from news programs and talk shows and newspapers whose people caught her on the Today Show and want to offer her another platform. She's as incapable of doing nothing as she is of believing that doing anything will matter. With Mina gone, everything anyone does comes too late. No, really, the woman in front of her says, you must be so proud. Today, all Vera wants is a coffee and a muffin and a quiet place not to be the woman whose daughter died in yet another preventable American tragedy. She wants to walk away onto an empty street against a blank sky and never see anyone or anything again. The proper word for it is devastated, Vera says. She meets the woman's eyes with what she hopes is a fury hot enough to set the woman's hair on fire. Then her eyes pool and her vision smears. She's so sick of crying. I know, I know, the woman says, reaching to brace Vera's forearm, then catches her when she slumps forward. It's not the same, she says into Vera's hair, but I lost my cousin. He shot himself last summer. There are too many guns in the world. 
Of course, she needs soothing too. Everyone needs. At the funeral, Mina's office mates lined themselves up and blubbered their gratitude and admiration, leaking their grief down her shirt collar, into her hair, clutching her toward them like she could save their lives all over again, as if she would. Vera would trade every last office mate survivor for a single coffee date with her daughter. Some days she thinks she could shoot them all herself if it would bring Mina back. Vera gasps air back into her lungs, wipes tears with waxy coffee shop napkins, first her own, then the strangers. They sidestep out of line. Vera steers them to a little bistro table in a private corner. The cashier brings ice waters and a tissue box foraged from somewhere, and Vera listens the same way she imagines Mina would have. She listens until this woman's pain fills some chamber inside her that somehow has room to hold it. When she's so full she's afraid she can't hold any more, she closes her eyes and concentrates until she can almost feel Mina from far above the coffee shop, above the clouds, thinking as hard as she can at her mother about tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks for having me too. Oh, Jody, wait, where did you go? I, sorry, I was, I was so blown away. I unspotlit you for a second there. Um, God, that was a, a, such a gorgeous story. And I love how you rendered the complexity of ambivalence so beautifully in that. And the complexity of, of all of the, the characters, the ones that didn't even appear directly on screen or on page. I don't know how to talk about fiction. I'm sorry. I'm a poet. I'm simple. Um, but it just it took my breath away. That is absolutely gorgeous. And thank you for sharing it with us tonight. Thanks. Thank you. I, it, it, it's been brewing for a long time in my head. I, there's this thing about bravery that our culture has that I think kind of gets it wrong, kind of misses something essential. And that's, and, and that's, that's why we need writers out there to, uh, to call our culture on that sort of nonsense. So thank thanks. you for doing it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. All right, and our final reader of the evening is Debbie Sosen. And Debbie graduated in January 2015 from the nonfiction track. She writes personal essays and cultural commentary. She has an award-winning picture book called Charlotte and the Quiet Place. And she's working on another picture book and looks forward to publishing more in the kidlit genre. Debbie has taught at Grub Street in Boston and offers individual writing, coaching, and editorial services in person and remotely, with a specialty in creative nonfiction and picture books. Uh, her essays have been published in WBUR's Cognoscenti, The Manifest Station, The Writer's Chronicle, Salon, and The Boston Globe Magazine. Debbie also has written a workbook, 42 Therapeutic Tools to Help You Recover from Problem Drug and Alcohol Use, and she's available to present workshops at addiction treatment centers and outpatient programs. Debbie, it is over to you. That was a pre-COVID bio. <laughs> Not doing presentations uh, at the moment, but thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me, and thanks to Cambridge Common Writers for, for setting these up. It's so wonderful. It just yeah, hearing the, the multi-genre readings is just puts me right back on, on campus in Leslie and just how rich it is to hear different voices from different genres. So um, thanks. I am going to be reading an essay called A Collaboration in Time, which was published in the New York Times last year in the Solver Stories column. Um, so, and <clears throat> if people want to know the, the, um, the like the submission to publication uh, journey, I, I'm happy to tell you, feel free to email me. Um, okay. Among my parents, voluminous piles of papers, stacks that filled file cabinets, drawers, and plastic crates, lay a battered two pocket folder with a handwritten label in faux calligraphy that read a portfolio of puzzles. The overstuffed folder contained dozens of blank and partially completed New York Times Sunday crosswords, both original and photocopied, dating from 1986 to 2002. 
In 2020, my brother and I were purging 50 years worth of our parents' accumul accumulated possessions. Mom, then 98, was moving to a smaller place with her caretaker. My father had died in 2015. My parents were both multilingual. Dad served in the Navy during World War II, decoding Japanese submarine communications. Mom was a Russian teacher and a Yiddish translator. They spoke German and French too. Growing up, I happily absorbed their linguistic and verbal prowess. Words held value, as did word games of any sort. On our frequent road trips throughout Europe, where we lived when I was a teenager, the four of us would play guessing games like Giotto, in which the clue giver thinks of a word and the solver offers a word in turn. The giver then tells the guesser how many letters match, and by process of elimination, the guesser eventually figures it out like Wordle. We'd use five letter words and my parents didn't dumb them down. By the time I was 11, I knew phlox, P-H-L-O-X, was a sure stump. For as long as I can remember, mom and dad did the Times crossword, acrostics, cryptograms, the daily jumble in the local paper, and myriad other puzzles. At bedtime, they'd ask each other for help. They were bickerers, as couples go, but when they solved a puzzle together, they were a team and a kind of peace prevailed. At the University of Michigan, I developed my own relationship with the Sunday puzzle. I split the time's subscription cost with my roommate and we'd finish it together in pen. When I moved to Boston after college, I began solving solo. For a long time, I enjoyed Sunday home delivery until it became too much of a stretch for my meager budget. But I wasn't about to abandon my weekly habit. So I'd go to my neighborhood variety store, extract the magazine section, pay 25 cents for a photocopy, replace the magazine section, and be on my way. All of the clerks knew me and allowed the ritual. Sometimes they would even put the last one aside. At other times, the machine would be down and I'd drive around even in a blizzard in search of a store with both a New York Times and a working photocopier. If I was sick, I'd ask a friend to save me a copy. If I was on vacation, I'd approach a stranger in a hotel lobby or an airport lounge who was reading the Times. I'd ask if they did the puzzle, and if not, would they mind ripping it out for me? Surprisingly, many did. Today, at long last, I have an online subscription, including premium puzzle access. To download the Sunday crossword at 6 p.m. every Saturday is a bliss. It's bliss. Yes, I still print it out. Some habits die hard. When I got home from cleaning out my parents' house, I gently unpacked the portfolio of puzzles as some of the original torn out pages had faded to yellow and were dried and cracking. I'll show you a little show and tell. This is the folder I'm talking about. And this is, these are these kind of crackly ancient puzzles um, from this, a lot from 1986. I counted 76 crosswords, 41 of them with scattered penciled in answers and 35 totally blank, just waiting for the touch of my blue pilot precise extra fine rolling ball pen. I've been trying to figure out why my parents, such diehard puzzlers never got around to this batch. Were they saving them and forgot? Had they made copies and filed the originals? In another time, I would have asked mom, but her memory was failing. Most of the pages date from 1994 to 1997. It's fun to tackle puzzles that old as the clues and answers reflect the zeitgeist. So far, I found arcane political clues like Whitewater Prosecutor Robert Fisk from 1996. There are, so, there are cultural anachronisms like Brosnan TV roll, Steel, 1996, and Liz has several X's. 1996, EXES. Clues that younger solvers might today might be hard pressed to answer. I waxed nostalgic while completing a January 1997 puzzle called Presidential Punditry, whose themes, whose themed clues referred to all things Clinton, including Hillary, the first lady, Socks, the first cat, Bill's biological father's name, Blythe, and a town called Hope. 
Besides the thrill of discovering the trove of pristine puzzles, I've also reconnected with my father, whose familiar, though faint, block print handwriting appears on the unfinished samples. It feels as if we are at the dining room table again, and he is teaching me fancy words like a tree, or eft, or ewer, or a pay, or eek. And those were just the E's. I can hear his queen's accent and recall his patience and delight at instilling in his daughter the family legacy of puzzle solving. I trusted dad's skill so much that one day while solving for, while solving for a five letter word with the clue name in computer software in a 1997 puzzle, I fought hard to retain his answer, Gates. I finally had to override him with the correct answer, the now defunct Lotus. And I stuck with hymnal in response to the clue, book of 150 songs, for far too long out of sheer loyalty before naturally replacing it with Psalms. Watching my blue pen glide over his pencil marks, I thought, I'm sorry, daddy, with a catch in my throat. Why did I feel guilty? By correcting his mistakes, was I somehow obscuring a part of him, his memory? Now, as I edge toward the age dad was when he amassed this portfolio, I am committed to finishing his unfinished puzzles. It's like a collaboration across time. He helps me out with the answers I wouldn't know on my own in categories like poetry and or mythology. And when I must cover up his wrong answers, lingering ghost-like on the page. I'll do it carefully with a nod of gratitude for my unexpected inheritance. Thank you. Oh my God, Debbie. Oh. I mean that, uh, I don't know if the kids still say that got me in my feels, but oh. um, that uh, it was just beautiful. It's such a lovely, thoughtful, smartly layered tribute to so many things but most of all to your parents so thank Aww. you for for sharing them with us in that essay thank and, you and for sharing your work tonight it was really really wonderful to hear that oh uh, thanks so much for having me that really means a lot wow i am going to unspotlight us uh and Folks can switch over to gallery view if they'd like. Um, and we're, we're at just about nine o'clock. So thank you for, for sticking with us through technical difficulties and through the, I know it's been a long day for folks who've been at the residency um, and also for those of us who you know have day jobs, which I think is most of us at this point. But I just wanna say on behalf of, of Cambridge Common Writers, thank you so much for sharing your work with us, for being part of CCW. Um, a reminder to all the folks in the audience that these folks have bios and links to their work up at cambridgecommonwriters.org. And uh, if you are not already familiar with us, check out our website. We would love to see you at a future reading and we're grateful to have you here. <laughs>